Okay, let us start. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to this session and participants. My name is Damir Esinalif. I'm joining to this session from Bishkek, uh, where we really started our conference, uh, Life in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, it's uh, eighth time, and I really you know, thankful for all those who submitted and joined today. So my introduction is just to really say hi from organizers because um, more or less official greetings will be tomorrow morning, but definitely it's a start of the conference and we are happy that it's taking place uh, in hybrid mode. And um, it's uh, indeed one of the largest probably in terms of content and number of people so uh, wish us all of us good luck and uh, giving floor to Susan Steiner to moderate the session and thank you Susan for moderating it. Let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much Damir. Um, and also big uh, welcome uh, to this online session on gender in Central Asia uh, from me. My name is Susan Steiner. I'm an adjunct professor at Hanover University in Germany. Um, and I worked uh, together with uh, Damir and Tillmann at the very beginning of the Life in Kyrgyzstan study. Um, so it's been a long journey uh, together. Um, and I'm very happy um, to, to be chairing this session. We have a... Um, a uh, full program, four presentations in a 90 to maybe 100 minute session. So uh, I don't want to lose a lot of words. Um, I look forward to four um, stunning presentations. Um, and I give the floor to Sauresh uh, immediately. Um, let me just uh, repeat again. We have supposed to be 90 minutes, given that we have for presentations, I would suggest we give 20 minutes presentation to each presenter and then five minutes of discussions. So if we do this, this will take us to a 100 minute session. I hope that all of you can bear for this amount of time uh, with everybody. So Saresh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So hello, everybody. My name is uh, Zaurish Atahanova. Um, so I work for Nazarbayev University School of Mining and Geosciences. Uh, I, uh, uh, there I teach uh, courses related to uh, economics of resource industries and project uh, analysis. Uh, my research interests are related to sustainable development and, and um, uh, topics related to resource policy, resources policy. So uh, today um, I would like to present my joint work, which was done together with my colleague Peter Howie, who also works for Nazarbayev University Graduate School of Public Policy. So um, our research is on gender in Kazakhstan's energy sector. Um, to some degree, this is a, 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 not a completely <laughs> Uh, kind of finalized research, just initial look at some of the issues that definitely requires further research and investigation. So our research was motivated by the fact that um, Kazakhstan has achieved very high uh, performance according to human development indicator, uh, including gender development. Uh, it is in um, a group one, of countries uh, that um, uh, uh, where um, countries uh, uh, have managed to achieve uh, very uh, significant progress in uh, gender development. Uh, so a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, this achievement is related to uh, very uh, uh, strong economic performance that Kazakhstan has. Uh, been uh, uh, producing, uh, uh, attaining since uh, its in, uh, independence in 1991. Uh, a lot of this uh, strong economic performance is related to 
the fact that Kazakhstan has very abundant natural resources uh, um, and has been actively um, uh, producing and exporting um, these natural resources, specifically uh, energy uh, resources. So Kazakhstan is among top um, 15 producers globally of primary energy. Um, in Kazakhstan, its extractive industries, uh, which includes petroleum and mining, uh, account for 30% of Kazakhstan's GDP on average. And um, petroleum sector itself uh, currently accounts for around 30% of government revenue. And in some years, uh, it I even accounted for uh, more than 50% of government revenue. Uh, on average, um, uh, the petroleum sector uh, accounts for around half of the value of exports from the country. So um, uh, our research is um, uh, looking into the question of to what degree have women benefited from uh, any employment opportunities that uh, energy sector has created. Well, we are also interested in whether uh, female and male earnings in the energy sector are same or uh, if they differ. And um, also uh, based on uh, these findings, we would like to get some uh, idea of whether uh, gender diversity or lack of it uh, is um, uh, impediment or a stimulus for uh, transition of uh, Kazakhstan's economy to more um, um, carbon neutral um, economy. So let's talk in general about um, uh, Kazakhstan's um, energy, uh, gender development. So um, as I have mentioned, Kazakhstan has, uh, is in group one countries according to the uh, gender development index. Uh, female work participation across all sectors is around 60%, which is very similar to the average in the OECD countries. Uh, Kazakhstan government started to uh, start, uh, started to bring gender more and more into its discussion around 2016 uh, when it has prepared its family and gender policy. Um, one of the um, interesting features of Kazakhstan and some of the other former Soviet Union uh, countries is that they have inherited a list of uh, jobs or prof professions, jobs basically, that were prohibited for uh, women, um, which was the legacy of the uh, kind of um, Soviet labor policy. So uh, over time, Kazakhstan has uh, reduced the, the list of these jobs and in 2020 has completely eliminated the jobs of such uh, at the list of such jobs. In general, uh, women in Kazakhstan are concentrated in the public sector, in healthcare and education, and are also in the informal sector. Uh, across all sectors, uh, women earn around 60% of what men earn. Uh, regarding female representation in the, uh, the, in the um, sphere of education, um, Overall, uh, women and girls account for about 50% of the student body. However, in uh, those programs that are related to energy sector at the university uh, level, uh, only 30% of students are women. In vocational programs, 20-25% um, uh, are women in oil and gas or chemical um, uh, industry related programs. And female representation is especially low in geology and mining vocational programs. So how does this compare to um, uh, the um, uh, experience of the in industrialized economies? So in general, uh, kind of female economic empowerment uh, is related to the kind of longer term structural change um, that's been happening in um, developed economies um, over time, of course. And, um, um, more and more women started to join the labor force uh, because of the uh, gradual increase in the service in importance of the service sector and declining the economic importance of manufacturing. Uh, so this um, uh, greater representation, representation of women in their workforce was also um, accompanied by uh, better 
um, kind of um, improvements in female and uh, male earnings, which in the 1960s stood around 60% and uh, rose to about 80% uh, in 2010, around 2010. So uh, several, many research has, uh, many re studies have been done uh, with respect to um, potential explanations for this uh, pay gap. And so in general, it is considered that differences in human capital, which uh, uh, basically refers to the education level and work experience, uh, explain uh, the difference between uh, uh, male earnings and female earnings. But there are also other factors such as race, region, uh, occupation and industry. In general, as you may well know, uh, the uh, um, childcare and parental leave, which normally are taken by women rather than men, uh, create some work interruptions that are often random and may impact productivity. So these gender roles are another explanation of kind of these uh, differences in male and female earnings. And also it is um, interesting that uh, um, uh, representation of women among uh, managers and other higher level, pay, uh, higher level jobs has been growing not so fast. And many attribute, uh, many researchers attribute this to some psychological uh, attributes such as aversion to risk, um, aversion to competition and bargaining, um, which is ascribed to uh, women. So how about uh, female representation in the energy sector? So overall um, in the OECD uh, countries, uh, female, uh, females account for around 48% of the workforce. Uh, that's across all sectors, but in energy related sectors, such as in oil and gas, their representation is only around 22%. The situation is better in renewable sector. Across all sectors, women account for about half of the senior, uh, sorry, uh, a third of the senior managers. However, in the oil and gas sector, they represent only 10%. So in general, this limited gender diversity is uh, uh, perceived as a um, barrier, some impediment to solving many of the energy sector's um, challenges, current, current challenges, which basically all relate to um, climate change. Uh, so um, many leading uh, energy companies have uh, developed uh, company policies that specifically aim at improving gender diversity. So let's go back to uh, understanding where Kazakhstan is in uh, this respect. So Kazakhstan is among 10, uh, top 10 exporters of oil and exporters of coal. Um, also, coal plays a very important role domestically uh, as it uh, accounts for 70% of electricity generation. Uh, this um, prevalence of uh, coal, uh, its dominant role in the energy sector, as well as the importance of other extractive industries, which are very energy intensive, has resulted in the fact that Kazakhstan now uh, is in top 10 countries according to uh, CO2 emissions per unit of GDP. So basically it is one of the highest uh, kind of uh, uh, contributors to uh, global, uh, global climate change on a, uh, from the uh, CO2 intensity point of view. So as you can see from this graph, um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas So Resh, I think you muted yourself. Uh, sorry. So a rise in economic activity has uh, resulted in growing uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, this um, trend seems to be difficult to, uh, be, uh, to kind of take control of since uh, Kazakhstan has been undertaking uh, several uh, initiatives in order to deal with the um, uh, issue of rising um, um, uh, CO2 emissions, but so far with a limited effectiveness. So Kazakhstan is a signatory of both Kyoto Protocol, Paris Agreement, 
um, ha, uh, it has been one of the first uh, middle income and in fact, the first Asian country to have ad adopted emissions trading system, uh, which also so far has shown only limited effectiveness. Uh, as a result um, of um, both uh, uh, kind of limited effectiveness of this system, which was supposed to um, you know, be a key instrument in Kazakhstan's carbon um, policy, uh, Kazakhstan has also adopted a new carbon neutrality policy where it is supposed to um, uh, not allow any new coal-fired electricity generation and phase out coal uh, power generation by 2050. Um, are women incorporated uh, fully included in this process of helping the energy sector in Kazakhstan to deal with the issues of very high um, uh, greenhouse gas intensity of Kazakhstan economy? Uh, why it is important is because multiple research has found that female leaders are very supportive for um, uh, management styles that embrace sustainability and in general, uh, diverse workforce is uh, more conducive to creativity rather than a non-diverse force. So our focus in our study is on three energy industries, which is petroleum extraction, um, coal mining, and the power industry. So they are all very different in the sense that uh, power petroleum industry is by far the largest one in terms of the value of output. Uh, in terms of employment, uh, power industry is the leading one uh, nationally, but on a regional scale, coal is also a very important employer. Um, and then uh, petroleum industry across all sectors is one of the highest paying in terms of the average salary. So in our uh, research, we used um, two sources of information. In general, the data on the, the, on the topic uh, is quite limited. So one source of uh, data for us was Kazakhstan Labor uh, Force Survey uh, that we uh, analyzed over four different years, overall spanning the decade between 2010 and 2020. Uh, here we analyzed involvement of women across eight groups of occupations. The second uh, source so, of- Rish, uh, Yeah. One second, just to let you know, you have five more minutes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. The second uh, uh, source of data was um, a publication um, which is based on the reports of the firms themselves, which represents information on average salaries of employees. Again, we had uh, data covering about a decade. So we were interested in a basic descriptive analysis of employment, and we also tried to analyze um, earnings uh, using some very, very basic um, uh, regression analysis due to limitations of data. So what are our findings? So overall, in these sectors, uh, most of the workforce is concentrated in medium, medium skilled type of workforce, such as heavy skilled and equipment operators um, type of occupation. Women are mostly concentrated in unskilled labor, and non-core occupations such as uh, human resource management, ac accounting departments, and so on. Um, also, we find that um, women's representation overall over time has been falling in all three industries. And also um, in at least two of the industries, their representation has been falling uh, among managers. Um, but uh, we can also say that among unskilled laborers, a women labor force was growing. So basically this means that women are concentrated in unskilled and auxiliary jobs within the labor sector. So overall earnings ratio has been not so bad. It was uh, between 90 and 99% and um, the ratio has improved over time. But the second firm report based data also indicates that the number of occupations held by both women and men has fallen drastically during 2021. So that makes us think that the pandemic has uh, really kind of pushed these three industries back in terms of improving their um, gender diversity. We also uh, have analyzed how uh, women's uh, earnings change 
as they move from a lower paid occupation to the next higher paid occupation. Do they rise to the same degree as men's earnings? And we find that across all three sectors, their earnings don't increase to the same degree as men's earnings. Uh, however, this particular analysis and these findings may be uh, kind of limited because we have not so many observations. That's number one, and we don't really include other explanations uh, for uh, these uh, in, uh, kind of improvements in earnings as we move to higher skills, again, due to data limitations. So uh, in general, what are some of our uh, findings? We find that women, unfortunately, uh, don't really, uh, didn't really have an advantage to um, uh, opportunities to take advantage of the growth of the energy sectors. Uh, they are concentrated in unskilled or non-core occupations within um, the energy industry. Their sh employment share has fallen during the pandemic. And even though the uh, women-men earnings ratio is close to one, uh, it looks like as that as women upgrade their skill and move to higher paying jobs, the increment in their payment is not as high as it is for uh, men also moving um, between these uh, uh, two skill groups. So um, as a result, what are the overall implications of these findings? So the energy sector in Kazakhstan is, does not really exhibit high levels of um, uh, gender diversity, even though there has been some progress over time. This progress seems to be pushed back during uh, the pandemic. Uh, with a um, particular area that needs attention is the fact that females are very underrepresented among managers uh, in the energy sector. And um, um, also um, because women are concentrated in low-skilled or non-core uh, occupations, most of the high earnings in the energy sector accumulate mostly to men rather than women. So the implication of all of this is that if Kazakhstan is to find you know, sustainable solutions for its current very high um, carbon intensity, it really needs to engage um, the uh, potential of uh, women um, this uh, requires more active uh, kind of um, policies, business policies uh, aimed at increasing gender diversity at these companies. Uh, that's from the business point of view. And then from the um, uh, public policy, policy point of view, it is really important also to in uh, increase uh, girls and women's representation in STEP education. So that's uh, basically all that I wanted to share with you today. If you have some questions, please let me know. Okay, thank you very much, Saresh, also for keeping the time uh, perfectly. <laughs> that was exactly 20 minutes. Um, so please raise your hands uh, or just speak up um, if you have any questions or comments for Saresh. May I? Um, yes, please. <laughs> I didn't see any other hands. Yeah, thank you. Um, a very nice uh, talk and overview. Um, unfortunately, maybe there wasn't enough time for all the methods, but I had the impression you estimated the different years and different subsectors or jobs separately. I wondered if you could just pool all of that and just throw it all in one big regression and just see if there are differences in the key, you know, years or year sector interactions or something like that. Otherwise, I'm a bit worried that all this data gets sort of separated out too much. Maybe it's a very technical comment, but um, yeah, just a thought. And sorry if I didn't perhaps, or if I missed perhaps something. Thank you. Thanks. Let's collect uh, one or two more questions and then have one round of responses. Hey. <clears throat> yes, Damir. Um, Zauresh, thank you very much. Um, I have a paper discussed in Anderson looking at um, raise of salaries for um, school teachers and uh, medical workers and we find a huge improvement in gender gap uh, over time because of that uh, policy change but my question to you was um why energy sector um i mean 
I'm not sure if you mentioned what extent this sector, particular sector, compares with the rest of economy, uh, especially in services sector, probably there are more representation of women, but still could be that uh, there is a negative gender uh, wage gap, uh, which doesn't favor women. So pro probably the question is why uh, your interest is in particularly in the energy sector. Thank you. We take one more. Okay, then maybe I may uh, raise one. Um, my my question is actually um, very simple. So you you showed the decrease in employment share of women in the energy sector, and and you assign that change to the pandemic. So I wonder, do you have any comparison numbers for other sectors? Was that in the of the same magnitude uh, comparable to the energy sector? And please, Soresh, uh, yes. you may now respond. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so regarding uh, Tillman's uh, question, whether it was possible to do, uh, as, uh, as far as I understand, panel data analysis, that's what you were probably asking, uh, right? To, um, it was, or pool uh, cross-section, if you know, pool cross -section. it may not be a panel, yeah? But. Yeah, uh, it was difficult uh, to do it uh, because, uh, but probably it is uh, feasible to do if we put some effort into it. The fact is, in the case of labor force survey, the individuals are not uh, the same, uh, or part of the individuals are not the same as we move from year to year. So that uh, complicates uh, our analysis for labor force survey uh, data analysis across time. And uh, uh, with respect to um, other earnings data, again, the data is very uh, sparse. Uh, it, it is difficult uh, to do a kind of more um, uh, kind of a common type of analysis. And uh, so far, it is just preliminary um, ideas that we came up with. And of course, the, uh, more needs to be done uh, and um, more data collection um, probably will be necessary in that case. Thank you for the suggestion. Uh, regarding uh, Damir's question, why specifically are we focused on genders uh, on energy sector? Uh, the question is uh, the answer is that uh, we this um, energy sector um, uh, is known uh, to be very non-gender diverse, and some of the researchers uh, find that. Um, this uh, kind of feature of uh, energies, uh, uh, energy sectors, um, labor force is very limiting and specifically constrains uh, the energy sector sector's adaptation and creativity with respect to finding solutions for how to adjust to climate change. So that was the main reason why uh, we focus on the energy sector. But of course, there is a lot more that could be done with respect to analysis of gender issues across uh, all sectors. And um, that requires uh, quite a bit more uh, of effort, of course, but uh, uh, we may be doing that as well. Uh, regarding I'm, the effect of the of the pandemic, specifically on the energy sector versus other sectors, whether we analyze this or not, uh, unfortunately, no, we didn't really have time, or we don't, didn't have data to compare energy sector to other sectors. So okay, that's, that's Susan's question. Thank you very much, uh, Saresh. And we are now moving um, straight to uh, Aksana's presentation on kinship, women, and property in Central Asia. Please, Aksana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Now, I would like to share my presentation. So. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm very glad to present my research findings. And I have 20 minutes. So I will, I will be presenting more anthropological work. Uh, and looking at the family aspect from economic perspective. Uh, and the title of my talk is on property, women, uh, their interaction, as well as 
I will analyze it through the prism of kinship in Central Asia. As we remember this uh, uh, famous uh, uh, portrait of a woman uh, during uh, COVID lockdown, there was a video circulating on social media that a woman in Kyrgyzstan was beaten up by her husband. And, uh, and it was the way how he was beaten was circulated everywhere, especially the terrible aspect was that this man who was beating his wife uh, put a pair of car tires around her neck and a woman's hands were tied and she was completely silent. In addition to it, men uh, poured a bucket of water over her head before hitting her. It was an extremely terrible uh, picture. And this, of course, has generated huge debate in Kyrgyzstan, especially uh, trying to protect the woman. Uh, and, uh, but there were two interesting um, responses that emerged out of this domestic violence. First, uh, this uh, woman, this man started to beat his wife and this became uh, very public. On the other hand, the woman decided uh, not to punish her husband for the sake of her marriage, family life, and relatives. And many couldn't understand why she decided to forgive her husband and ask the police to release her husband because he was already in, the pre in prison. And uh, the response of international organization was that um, usually domestic violence or gender-based violence in, uh, in general are quite uh, uh, remnant not only in Tajikistan but also in the whole Central Asian uh, region and the problem uh, they explain it is deeply rooted in the way society sees a woman as property. So here I started to investigate and understand more the property relations property aspect of Central Asian women. And, uh, and the, the question remains why the, the protection uh, of law, a woman doesn't work in the Central Asian context. And there are, of course, local ideas about women in society. And these are, uh, of course, save your family at any cost and be patient. And divorce is not accepted at all. So di divorce is a sign of disgrace. And relatives of uh, both women and men try to persuade her to go to the reconciliation or lock her up with the husband. And the, uh, the domestic violence, oops, oops, domestic violence is not a, considered to be a police matter, rather really personal uh, territory. And here, police try to avoid domestic violence issue. And another thing, of course, women have fear that they would live alone without the roof over their heads. And uh, and then uh, the final point is, of course, parents or relatives refuse to take her back. Uh, because of stigma or threats or shame. As a result, what we see here is that the woman end up uh, being alone without the kind of a support. And uh, the, the situation with Central Asian women, as we know that uh, already uh, 10, 10 years ago, Candioti has written that Central Asian women are neither colonized nor modern. Uh, meaning that Central Asian women maintain traditional kinship structure. They are quite active in arranging marriage rules. They also um, control the resources as well as actively involved in local economies. But at the same time, they are also very quite active uh, drivers of uh, change and adaptations uh, in, in times of transition in Central Asian context. And when we look at the broader picture of Central Asian women, what we see here is that the, they are in between of Soviet heritage and strong nationalism, Islam and uh, Western ideals. So, for example, as we know that uh, during the Soviet time, um, women were more or less emancipated, they would engage in wider economy. And, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, what we see here is the revival of Islam, conservatism, traditionalism, due to the promotion of uh, nationalism by uh, Central Asian authoritarian regimes. And on the other hand, we also see the Western donors who promote gender equality, individual private property. So Central Asian women are in between of Soviet heritage, strong nationalism, 
between conservative Islamic and Western ideas and ideals. And, and uh, why nevertheless Central Asia is a good place to study gender because it's a good laboratory for investigation, all kinds of contradictions. And, and these uh, Muslim societies um, feature diverse modes of social organizations because of uh, historically different economic sub, uh, subsistence strategies. For example, Kyrgyz, Kozak, Kazakhs used to be mobile herders or post, uh, pastoral nomads, and they were mainly engaged in livestock breeding. However, with Uzbek and Tajiks, what we see here, they are sedentary farmers or urbanities, and their main occupation were craftsmen or traders. As a result, what we see here, a kind of a different uh, Central Asian kinship societies emerge with the uh, different kind of source cultural diversity. When we look at Kyrgyz and Kazakh, they for example, treat their daughters as guests. So meaning that once they get married, they would move to the husband's uh, family. Uh, ideal marriage it has to be as long as uh, distance, distance should be as long as possible. A uh, residence rule is that the uh, patrilocal residence, meaning then upon the marriage, the girl has to move to the uh, husband's uh, household. And the bright price is involved a lot among Kyrgyz and Kazakh. This is kind of a compensation of daughters' economic services. And Kyrgyz Kazakhs are quite patrilineal, a society in which a seven generation really matter. When we look at the Uzbek and Tajiks, they see their daughters as vulnerable, or jiza, meaning that this means that the local idea is that they need a lot of support. And then and the woman, Uzbek and Tajik women get a lot of support because of these local ideas of Ojiza, meaning vulnerable. Uh, usually uh, we tend to help the vulnerable. So the idea is based on this notion of uh, providing support to daughters. And uh, marriage should be within a short distance. And residence rule is um, uh, both ways work because uh, upon the marriage, uh, woman can move to the husband's family, but usually this husband's family are located within a short distance from their natal family. But uh, among Tajik and Uzbeks, we see a lot of uh, uh, involvement of uh, dowry, mean, meaning this is, this is pre-mortem inheritance for the daughters. And uh, here of, of Uzbeks and Tajiks, the bilateral society in which uh, Mm, idea uh, the cousin marriage is preferable at the same time both mother side and father side are equally important compared to Kyrgyz and Kazakh who have who tend to have more patrilineal uh, bias and since uh, the gender should be uh, space is usually segregated usually men and women eat separately mainly because of this uh, rule of cousin marriage in which there is potentially cousin uh, pool of uh, future uh, marriage uh, partners. Therefore, they try to make sure that the close relatives uh, are um, see uh, are um, given food, for example, separately. And now I would like to come back to the concept of property for women and the way how uh, property is um, understood in the Central Asian context. It's not only about the ownership but it's really about the relations, morality, and embeddedness. So I would argue that the Central Asian overall status is their position within their property relationship as they are actually, they can also be a potential property owners, but also items of property themselves, as well as providers and recipients of productive and reproductive labor, which I will discuss below. And uh, the existing scholarship on Central Asia on property issues are really focusing on land grazing rights or livestock or land grabs, but they usually neglect to look at the woman's property relations through the prism of marriage and kinship system. And property regime is not only ownership, as I have said already, instead property can be seen as a bundle of rights. Not all of this bundle of rights amount to full ownership. And at the same time, within the patriarchal, patrilineal system of Central Asian context, women have also their own agency. 
And usually uh, they seem to describe women a lot as if they're oppressed or inferior or suppressed. But at the same time, they also have, uh, when we look at the, their own world, we, how they view it themselves, uh, we can, uh, without even uh, verbalizing all the support that women get, is they, there are a lot of other types of kin network exist uh, from patrilineal kin, kin network. For example, there are a lot of strategies for caring for daughters or a lot of women get support um, uh, for childcare or other needs, or they usually negotiate with patriarchy. They find ways how to deal with men in making sure that their uh, voices are heard. So there are a lot of strategies that women use in, in, in patriarchal society. And I have been in, uh, researching kinship and women for many years using different kind of uh, programs for research. Mm, and um, what I would like to hear say is that um, uh, oh, there might be a question uh, in, in this uh, patriarchal society, of course, this woman uh, have to usually stay in such relationship, even in abusive relationship, because they are dependent on, on their husband. And this, this exactly the patriarchy prevents women from getting jobs or making them dependent on their husbands for income. In such context, as we know that women use usually patriarchy to exercise their own agency. And this has been already like 30 years ago was written by Candiotti that the way how women in, in such societies quite good in making, convincing their um, boss or husbands in, in dealing and co cooperating with patriarchy. And now I would like to come back to the issue of uh, the way how economy and culture intersect in the Central Asian context, especially intersection of property, work and family relations, uh, specifically the economic contribution of wife and husband, parents, children to the household. So individual families uh, can be understood as a kind of a single economic unit and each member makes a complementary, complementary economic contribution, such as the sum of several members efforts to make, um, efforts makes up the total household economy. So hypothesis is based on the labor and inheritance can be applied, meaning that if one contributes to the household labor, labor one is entitled to inherit. And uh, in families, uh, labor is organized on the basis of kinship relations, age and gender. And for example, when we look, come back to the woman and the value of women's economic and social contribution vary uh, between ethnic groups. For example, Uzbek and Tajik uh, women, uh, among Uzbek and Tajik, they value, and uh, for example, looking after children, child care, and uh, help in the household are extremely valuable as economic value compared to Kyrgyz and Kazakh who encourage women to engage in paid work. And so here, as a result, what we see here is um, this intergenerational transmission of property and marriage payments through this dowry and bride price are also linked to family economic transaction and compensation. For example, as, as we have said, uh, among Kyrgyz and Kazakhs, they uh, encourage their daughters to engage more in labor, in paid labor, yeah, once they get married, they usually, the girl's parents usually get the, this bright price, which is the compensation of daughter's economic services. However, among uh, Uzbek and Tajik, they usually get the pre-mortem inheritance for their daughters, since they have to stay um, at home in a new family once they get married and take care of children, and they might not have... Um, uh, and they, they try to make sure that they are not completely dependent on the husband. So a uh, woman, uh, woman's parents really uh, make sure that they are more or less economically independent from their uh, uh, husband's family. As a result, we see the importance of uh, a dowry, economic importance of dowry. So what Aksana, is- mm -hmm. five more minutes. Okay, I do have five more minutes. And so the combination of identity and indebtedness is at the root of a bright price and dowry. So depending on the economic basis and contribution and change, 
different identities face changes. So this lead to a change in the values and status of women and their economic contribution, meaning that once a girl gets married, and the, her value, economic value would, of course, uh, would change once she's in the new family. But again, through this bride price dowry, we see exchange of uh, property and um, property transaction. Uh, another aspect is this woman I have shown at the beginning of the presentation about this. This woman has been described as a property of the husband. What we see here is that in Central Asian context, property is not only about ownership but it's super complicated because of these relations because of morality embeddedness and the woman belongs to a larger social unit it's not only she is the property of the husband and but really she becomes the part of economic unit of the extended family even if her husband beats or uh, there are other uh, family members who would uh, convince her uh, to forgive, for example, and make sure that uh, this husband and wife would not uh, fight each other. But really about uh, the main point is that I want to show that woman uh, is not only has her own economic value within a uh, family, larger family kin network, and, she, and she's valued. And uh, this value, we can see it in, in different ways and in, in times of um, this kind of uh, conflict between husband and wife, other families, family members have rights to say uh, no to the husband or make sure that this couple would uh, live together in peaceful, peacefully. And as a result, we see because of this complex relationships are involved in uh, such a uh, in network among Kyrgyz or uh, Kazakh or Tajik and Uzbek, uh, for outsiders it, it become very un understand. Uh, it's very hard to understand uh, the decision of such women when they start to forgive uh, their husbands. So I will stop here, and I'm looking forward to your. Thank you very much, Aksana, uh, for a very thought-provoking presentation. Um, so again, uh, please raise your hands if you have a question uh, or just speak up as you wish. Well, very um, tiny question to clarify, maybe. Uh, Aksana, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I originally come from Uzbekistan and to the best of my knowledge, of course, I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, also, bride price is very widely practiced in Uzbekistan. So then I don't understand what would be able to explain the differences that were observed because also in Uzbekistan, we see very prevalent domestic violence cases without being reported by the wife or being actually withdrawn, the reports being withdrawn by the, by the wives. So I would be really glad if you you could share your opinion on that. Thank you. Aksana, I suggest we again um, uh, collect a number of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie? Yeah. Um, first, Aksana, I, I, I thought this was fascinating. And my question is, so is my sense is that there are, there are many people live in, in multi-generation households, and as as women age, or as their and as their husbands age, the role of women as they become mothers and um, eventually um, mothers-in-law rises in the household. But also that implies perhaps that having a mother-in-law could make things um, even more difficult. Um, do you do you have a sense of how the role of the role of mothers-in-law in Kyrgyz society? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Tillman, last one. Yeah, thank you very much for a very thought-provoking presentation. Really two comments rather than two questions. Um, uh, the first one is, um, at the beginning, you described the factors that drive some of these behaviors, you know, Soviet times, uh, religion, et cetera. And, it, and I kept thinking, okay, this is extremely exogenous, right? I mean, um, these women are described as victims or, or like they are victims, but as, as objects, almost in the way that the literature seems to portray these external influences. And so I want to commend you for highlighting the role of agency and different strategies. And I thought that was really the, 
the strength of um, your presentation when you show how they navigate these spaces. And I think that's fascinating and, and much more interesting than being told that yet again an ideology or whatever you know ruled people's lives because uh, people find ways of coping with these things for better or worse you know sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't secondly um while i understand that some of the ways this plays out in central asia might be specific to a particular country or ethnic group or socioeconomic class or whatever um you know these are truly universal phenomena yeah and um gender-based violence occurs in any society in, in any class in any yeah um and I, I don't think there's a country, uh, you know, which does well on that count, like really well. Yeah. So um, I just might be worth also acknowledging that and not making it look like this is a Central Asian issue. It's not. It's a universal issue, sadly. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tilman. And then um, back to Oksana. Mm -hmm. I will try to be as quick as possible. But the, the way how I understood the first question is... Um, that in Uzbekistan there are also a bright price, right? Uh, and why uh, you talk more a lot about dowry uh, in uh, among Uzbeks? Um, I also because when we look at the Kyrgyz context, there are, in Kyrgyzstan there are also a lot of bright price as well as uh, um, dowry. Both of them exist. But when you compare uh, the the value of dowry with the uh, bright Price, for example, they are asymmetrical. There is no such thing in Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan that you would see that uh, dowry and um, bright price would be symmetrical, so that the value would be equal. And when you look, then there is a big difference in each. For example, for among Uzbeks, uh, they might say we gave a bright price, which can be one uh, value of like uh, twenty dollars uh, compared to dowry, which is five thousand uh, uh, dollars. So the, there is a huge difference between uh, the value between dowry and bride price. And I was fascinated to see that people keep saying uh, the terminology of bride price or dowry, but when you look go back deeper into um, the structural structural level, you see there is a big uh, difference. In, and it's the same in Kyrgyzstan, and um, and so I would explain this in terms of this uh, asymmetrical value really matters. Another thing about the mother-in-law, uh, um, I have written an article on how the status of woman uh, uh, changes with increase of age. For example, with age, and uh, for example, at the beginning of a woman's career, so-called when she is just get she just got married, she's Galin, young bride or daughter-in-law, she has um, um, less uh, rights or um, and uh, she doesn't have a lot of authority. Once she gets first child, second, third, uh, she her authority increases with time and with the number of children. But once she's in the position of being a mother-in-law, she has, she's the super powerful woman. And she can really uh, have, and in, in during this, when she becomes this mother-in-law, she can really, uh, she, she can be so powerful that sometimes can really challenge these patriarchal um, notions. And, and uh, so in, not only in Kyrgyzstan, but in the whole Central Asia, I can say that the, the mother-in-law's um, authority increase uh, with the, the way how she behaved, number of children, and the, the way how she is treated in the society. And it's really good that you raised that this um, domestic violence is not only unique to Central Asian context. I absolutely agree with you. And we also see that in Western societies, we also see lots of domestic violence, violence cases. So. I am very grateful that you have raised this issue, but I think in the future I should also write at the beginning to highlight that this is not unique to Central Asia. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, Aksana. Um, then we are now looking forward to Mansura's uh, presentation on the role of gender and birth order in child nutrition. Thank you. 
Sorry for um, for being so slow. Um, my name is Manzo, and I, uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the Technical University of Munich, the School of Social Science and Technology. And this is a paper in progress. Uh, I would say um, it's been um, it's been quite long that we're working on it, and the estimation part keeps changing. So I I will probably get a lot more comments today, and also um, uh, implement those. Um, so this paper is written jointly with my supervisor Janina Steinert and also Kara Ebert, who works at uh, RWI uh, uh, Institute in Berlin. Um, so just to give the first update, today I'm talking about the role of sun preference and birth order in child development. And by a sun preference, um, just to quickly define it at the very beginning, it's the preference for a boy child within the household. Um, it is not um, prevalent in all the parts of the world, but this preference for boys is uh, mostly uh, dominant in South and East Asia, but the evidence from the Central Asia has been quite lacking. So the reasons why we observe actually some preference are institutional. So we see the countries where land and property um, rights usually pass through the male hairs. So the families do need a uh, do see a need to have a son within the family to pass their assets and so on. Um, it is also economic. So as uh, we've already um, seen a couple of times today, girls um, tend to have lower economic returns when it comes to their wage. And we observe this wage gap uh, despite the educational and uh, human um, capital that both boys and girls possess. Uh, we also see this higher wage earning potential of men, which can act um, as an old age security and insurance for parents, and especially in the societies where we don't have uh, full and properly functioning insurance and security services, this um, is a very um, prevalent factor for parents to prefer boys over girls. Uh, the last one is cultural, and this is the part that is a little bit hard to explain or to change also in terms of policy implications. So um, in terms of cultural uh, determinants of sun preference, we look at the family lineage. So in most of the societies, we see that family lineage can be continued only through male hairs, especially in the patrilineal and patrilocal societies where wives move in with husbands, families, and so on. So then uh, as the many, uh, one of the proverbs uh, in this um, field uh, uh, actually sound is raising a daughter is like uh, watering a neighbor's um, garden. So in general, parents do not actually see any benefit of investing too much uh, into their daughters given the restricted um, resources that they have within the families. So why do we care actually about some preference and why it is important? Um, the existing evidence suggests that there are higher abortion rates for female fetus where we observe very high sun preference. Um, especially now in the Caucasus countries in Armenia and Azerbaijan, we see quite a growing number of abortions against uh, uh, girl uh, children compared to boys, which is distorting the sex ratios at birth in those um, societies. We also see that in the absence of this prenatal discrimination, which is a sex selective abortion, we also see a postnatal discrimination in the form of uh, less investments into girls starting from the very early childhood. Uh, so we see that girls are breastfed for shorter periods compared to boys, and uh, they are more prone to neglect and lack of sufficient child care. They're more prone to be wind earlier than boys and uh, have less quality time with parents. Uh, we also see that they have lower immunization rates um, and the immunization rates depends if it's on the full immunization or specific immunization, but we still see differences, especially for the regions uh, that, uh, that actually show some preference. Um, overall, these factors also influence then the physical growth of children in those societies, and uh, the evidence suggests that girls have uh, um, a lower height for age uh, 
and gender. So they are smarter in comparison to boys. And because of parents' decision to have sons, usually girls tend to grow up in the families with more siblings. So parents keep on trying uh, having children and they exceed their desired fertility in the uh, conquest for having another son or for having at least one son. So uh, in general, then they, they by default tend to grow up in different family structures than do boys that are born at a, um, earlier birth orders. Um, subsequently, this differential investment also uh, continues into more adolescence and more adult life of their children and uh, girls usually receive less education and health investments compared to their brothers. Um, and everything summed up, they also have a greater mortality risk at the early age, despite the medical um, advantage that they are born with at the very beginning, uh, where they have actually a stronger immune system compared to boys. Um, the study context is Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so um, as has been already told, Kyrgyzstan is performing poorly on gender equality indicators, especially with the rising domestic violence uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic and, and so on. Um, and also upon the collapse of the Soviet Union, women have been portrayed as caregivers and mothers, which is a uh, reverse trend compared to what has been portrayed during the Soviet Union as women being part of the labor force and the economy. Um, the incidence of bride kidnapping, early marriages, and forced marriage increased actually after, in the, in, after independence, which is very counterintuitive uh, to, to what we would have expected. Um, and uh, also one uh, worrisome statistics is that stunting grades or the lower height for age, um, uh, the scores of children under five years old is at 12% uh, with the highest um, percentage for children between one and a half and two years old. So uh, with this paper, we're trying to um, understand the nature of sun preference. There is no claim for causal relationship or causal causality in this paper whatsoever. We're um, just uh, simply assessing the nature of sun preference. If we actually observe any differences between boys and girls um, growth rates, and uh, the questions were threefold. So we were interested to know if there is any sun preference in the Republic of Kyrgyzstan that we can observe. Uh, the second one is, does the birth order matter for a child's development in Kyrgyzstan? And this question uh, we were especially interested is, is there a youngest son preference in the Kyrgyz Republic? So the reason why we're interested in this question is because in China or India, for example, where eldest sons are the ones who reside with their uh, parents uh, upon their retirement or uh, in, their, in their old age, um, uh, in Kyrgyzstan or in the context of Central Asia more generally, it's the youngest son who actually stays with the parents and the older sons are the ones who move out. And in the case of India and China, what authors have found so far is that um, it, within the family, parents prefer sons over daughters, but even among sons, they prefer the eldest son among others. So we were interested in this particular type of relationship. We wanted to see if parents prefer old sons or if a uh, younger son actually gets um, a, more, um, a better investment uh, in terms of health. Uh, so we're using life in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan panel data set for the last four available waves. So we're still waiting for the 2009, if it can actually, uh, 2019, uh, if uh, we can actually add this and um, it would uh, give us a different, uh, and the direction of the results. At the end, uh, when we exclude the missing values for the variables that uh, we have, um, ah, great, <laughs> thank you, Tillman. Uh, um, so we've uh, pulled all the um, children under five years old for our analysis, and then uh, looked um, at the children without missing values uh, in terms of the variables that we're looking at. Um, okay, so the dependent variable of our interest is height for AC scores, and we're especially interested in this uh, outcome variable because 
Um, fat for age is um, known to be a long-term determinant of growth in children. So weight of, uh, of the child can be very, um, very sensitive to the timing of the survey and the data collection, while height actually shows a long-term growth um, uh, norm of the child. Um, the independent variables uh, are birth order of boys and birth order of girls. So we're actually interacting this uh, birth order and the gender of the child in the regression analysis. And we control for the age of the child, maternal characteristics um, and household characteristics. Uh, and we include in the last uh, model, mother year fixed effects to control for the um, unobserved heterogeneity of children of the same mother. Um, so this is uh, kind of the first uh, um, the first snapshot that we saw at the very beginning. So what we see is that at the very uh, first birth order, um, we see that um, girl, uh, both boys and girls are disadvantaged. So their uh, mean height for AZ score is actually below zero. But what we actually observe here is that um, compared to the birth order one sons, uh, later born sons are less disadvantaged in general. But we also observe similar pattern for girls. Uh, this is a descriptive statistics um, where we um, summarize some of the main uh, variables that we have. So age of children, the average age in months of children is 32 uh, with 48% of, um, the, um, of the observations being girls. Um, and uh, what we also observe is that uh, the average age of mothers um, is uh, 29, uh, with uh, around two and a half children per mother. And we also um, created this variable of completed fertility, um, defining it as one if we don't see a mother giving birth between the first and the last wave. And the reason why we're doing it is actually to see um, or to make another sensitivity analysis. If our um, analysis are sensitive uh, to the mothers who keep giving birth uh, in between of the waves, because as I've already told at the beginning, the fertility decision of parents is endogenous. And so the number of children that we're adding or the number of boys that is um, that we're controlling for in the regression is not fully solving for this problem because parents actually might continue having children depending on the sex composition of the previous one. So um, actually, if we have already the 2019 wave, it would be even better because that would uh, already allow us to look at the parents who didn't have children from 2011 and 2019, which gives a longer time span to prove that this might be a feasible um, time uh, frame for um, believing that the fertility of mothers have been finished. Um, so this is the main um, um, the main uh, result that we have. So in general, what we see is that uh, girls are not um, disadvantaged or it's not statistically significant. So if we look at the general pattern of boys versus girls, we don't see any disadvantage of girls in terms of height for age these scores. But as we move uh, to uh, um, um, so as we move then towards the next birth orders, what we are actually seeing is that a third or later born child of a mother, and if it's a son, we see a very weak, uh, but um, at the very beginning at least, um, uh, a quite um, um, indication that um, third or later born children of a mother are uh, better off compared to uh, the first or uh, firstborn son. So we see this advantage compared to the firstborn son, but we do not see this advantage confirmed for girls. However, once we control for mother fixed effects, uh, this um, whole result uh, fades away, which is an indication or which might be an indication that actually maternal characteristics uh, observed or unobserved can be determinants of this difference that we observe in the previous column. Mansura, you have yeah. five more minutes. Uh, yes. Um, okay, we run a number of heterogeneity analysis and robustness checks. So we did heterogeneity analysis by location, separating the rural urban uh, sample by family structure. We wanted to look at the children who live in the extended families versus nuclear families. Um, we also did five income quantile um, 
sampling to see um, what is happening in each of these income quantiles and uh, by mother's education. So here it was a bit hard because we do not specifically do mother's education as given in the leak uh, data set like primary education, tertiary or secondary, because uh, there is a very um, small uh, variability in the education. So we decided to go with low and high. Uh, it would be anything lower than tertiary or tertiary as the low uh, education and then tertiary as a high education, um, highly educated mothers. And we observed no statistically different results to, compared to those that we had in the main specification. Uh, we also replicated the analysis with the multiple indicator cluster survey for Kyrgyzstan uh, for 2018. And again, we find no statistically significant results for the role of birth order and uh, gender on uh, height of the child. Um, so, Obviously, there are a lot of limitations of this paper as of now, and um, uh, we're hoping to uh, strengthen it a bit. Uh, first of all, the measurement of some preference, which we are now trying to measure as just a gender variable, is not the uh, best indicator of some preference because it's just a gender. Um, we also have a lot of uh, immediate variables that could have been controlled for. Um, something uh, like maternal health, because we don't have any information on the existing maternal health issues on the leak data set. We also don't have actually existing child diseases or not the, um, uh, not the detailed list of the diseases that the child had. Uh, we don't have parental anthropometric measures, so the height of uh, children under, um, if I'm not mistaken, 16 or 19 years old, or 18 years old was measured in the data set. So uh, parent um, anthropometry is not there. And uh, if we had this desired fertility, um, desired fertility variable, it would have been even better because then we could actually see the differences between the observed and the desired fertility and also control for that bias. Uh, we also see that when we control for mother year fixed effects, it reduces the sample substantially because it actually drops all the mothers who have uh, less than two children and of the same gender. So it actually halves the sample size that we've got. So it's also a bit problematic and uh, yeah. So in conclusion, we don't find a strong um, linear relationship uh, between gender and birth order of a child and his her height. Uh, when we also check for the heterogeneity um, by different uh, specifications, we also do not find any, um, uh, any differences um, in the height of these uh, subsamples. So yeah, <laughs> thank you, that was it from my side. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mansoura, for a very interesting presentation. Um, there was already one question in the chat. Michelle, do you want to um, read it yourself? Uh, yeah, thanks. So it was just, I mean, you spoke to kind of my concern with your last um, slide about the dropping out of the single gender families or if there's just one child. Uh, and, and in effect, I was thinking of if you isolated the analysis to single child families, mm -hmm. uh, what is the role, you know, would you would you expect to see a difference in the way that the parents um, on average treat girls versus boys are, and do they have like, if it's just one child, is that child then expected to care for the parents in the old age, regardless of gender, or are they expected to, to um, do something different? And so it, it might be interesting um, to think about it in that way, or again, um, looking at families that have two children, uh, if there's an, enough sample size. So I think these dynamics are quite different. And obviously, who, who has three children versus two versus one, it can be, there can be a massive selection effect. So it might be interesting to get into that, describe who these families are a little bit more. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mansoura. We take, we take two more. Yeah. So uh, there's Tillman and then Chris. Uh, Tillman, please, first. Yeah. Thank you very much. A really uh, great paper. and. Um, I think it's good you show it even if you're, you know, it's work in progress. Um, very briefly on the boy preference, I had assumed that one would study that by looking at uh, fertilities or realized fertilities subject to how many children there were already and what gender they had. So 
I was expecting you would run a regression on, you know, are they going to have another kid, uh, given what kids they have, and then not focus it just on the little ones, yeah, just to, because, the, yeah, there's a lot of families in there, so you may be able to to get to that first question of yours that way. Um, the second thing is that if I understand, it was very brief, I looked at the slide and, you know, um, it's a short presentation, but if I understood your interaction term correctly, you basically have no finding, unfortunately, yeah? I mean, they, they were all insignificant on that gender versus birth order, red or whatever it was, um, row of uh, coefficients, yeah? So I, I, it may be a bit of a stretch to say you have a weak effect. I, I wondered if maybe you didn't. And the third point is, yes, I realize there's some variables which you maybe would like to have in sort of demography in which you don't have, but I'm wondering if there are alternative variables you can use um, to control for things in, and you can interpret them in the way you want. I mean, you know, what energy they use um, in the household can vastly influence whether children suffer from respiratory diseases, the birth weight of the child is a measure of the role of the woman in the household, as Susan probably knows, um, and other things like that. So I wondered if you can just throw in some more control to try to cover what you don't have in explicit variables, which other literatures might, or other papers use, which use DHS or, or similar. Thank you. Thank you, Tillman. And then um, Chris. Uh, thank you, and, and, and thanks, thanks, Manza, a really interesting presentation. Um, Tillman stole some of my questions. Um, <laughs> you, have to get in, you have to get in quick to beat you, Tillman. Um, but but what, what remains, actually, and forgive me, I may have missed this right at the beginning, I missed the, the very start of your talk, but, but I didn't see the sort of graph over time or anything for the sex ratio at birth data, which is available uh, nationally, because that's normally one of the motivating kind of stylized facts that you know, there's 115 boys per girls or whatever. Um, whereas your motivating slide, if I remember rightly, it was they were all legitimate concerns, but without the, the stylized fact about the, the the actual the actual problem. Just on the on the point that um, uh, Tom made about the red numbers and 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 their sort of insignificance, and you know, no finding is sometimes an interesting finding. Um, I think there's another paper in Asian population studies that came out this summer. I uh, forget the name of the guy, I think it's a, a Russian guy. I, I've saw, seen it somewhere. And I think he also finds no um, interesting um, or no significant rather um, effect. And then the other question I had is, you, you mentioned the, the, you know, the, the very well-known cases, China and India. And I just wonder how the Kyrgyz or Central Asian situation compares to um, some, the, the South Caucasian, uh, South Caucasian region, um, because you know Georgia, Armenia, I think Azerbaijan as well, all had high um, sex ratio at birth figures until pretty recently. I think they've now reverted. Certainly in the Georgia, they've reverted to to rough parity. But but from the mid uh, mid early nineties through to about 2015, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was a a major concern with some preference in those countries. So I just wondered how, given the the the, the you know the Soviet um, legacy um, that they share. I wondered how that how that story compared to your um, story, but, but really interesting. Okay, thank you, thank you Chris. Uh, and I'm I'm sorry, Mansoura, but you have one minute to respond. Uh, so it's absolutely impossible to respond to all of this. So maybe you pick out one question and respond to that. Thank you. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll just respond to a very technical answer, a very easy to respond. So for the electricity and for giving this proxy, actually I construct this principal component analysis using 15 variables from the leak data set on the floor, asset, uh, the proximity to a healthcare facility and so on. And whenever uh, I was using that, um, I didn't find anything different. Uh, so that would be my short answer. Uh, as for the sex ratios at birth, actually in Kyrgyzstan they're not um, uh, within the biologic, uh, they are already within the biological norm. And the reason how I motivated my study was actually, I think, a bit biased from uh, Uzbekistan, where I already saw some discrimination against girls. So maybe at the macro level, it wasn't visible. So I wanted to check it at the micro individual level. And um, yeah, we find nothing. But I, again, think that it is still a good uh, finding to to show that at least under the age of five, we don't see any statistically significant differences between boys and girls. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Mansoura. And I'm sorry, there's not more time for discussion. Uh, but I guess the, the 
the biggest contribution anyways is for Mansura to think about your questions. Mm -hmm. um, so then um, it's time for the last uh, presentation. Um, and I give the floor to uh, Charlie Becker, who presents a joint work on pride abduction, depression, and labor market outcomes. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, let's see what... Can you, can you hear me, Susan? Yes, we hear you. We also see the slides. You just need to put them into presentation mode. Oh my gosh. You click, Susan? you click, yes. Can you hear me? You don't hear yes, us? I, I, I can hear you. I just got this note from Zoom that it crashed. Okay. It seems oh. I've returned. No, you... we, yeah, we hear you, we see the slides, everything okay, seems good. fine. <laughs> okay, um, it's wonderful. It's, it's great being able to be the last person here um, because these other talks were fascinating and, and motivating. And this is joint work with Susan Steiner and also Lin Zhao, who is a PhD candidate in finance, who is much more interested in, in labor market outcomes in Central Asia than in finance, fortunately for us. Okay, it seems, Charlie, we don't hear you. You're also on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm having problems here. Okay, I'll, I'll go through this quickly in case it crashes some more. Yeah. So we know that... I, I don't see the presentation anymore. Am I the only one? Correct. No, no, the presentation is gone. Is it there? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so... So we find, we know that we've been working for a long time on on the impacts of what we call, you know, it's commonly called zakhvat nivyesti or bride kidnapping, um, pachishini nivyesti. On Susan Steiner and I have, with Bahram Mirkasimov, have worked on the long run effects on of bride kidnapping on childbirth weight. We've also looked at, um, We've also looked at um, their impacts, uh, the effect of, of bride kidnapping on psychological and assortativeness of mating and, and to some extent psychological effects. We believe from this in general that marriage types can affect mental health conditions. And we're now taking a next step to explore whether mental health conditions also affect labor market outcomes and we this is tricky because people are in very different areas so we focus on the probability of being being contributing to family work as opposed to being outside the household in the labor force we find um to summarize marriage types do affect labor market outcomes and that the mental health channel explains about one third of all treatment effects of marriage types on, on these labor market outcomes. So I just went through this. Um, I won't, in the interest of time, I won't say much again, other than there's, there's evidence prior to um, this paper that uh, mental health does affect labor market outcomes. There's also a fairly straightforward um, couple studies on mediation, these indirect effects, mediation effects, and we're following um, the, um, the Keel and Yamamoto and Barron and Kenny papers. Um, mediation effect is very simple. If you look at, if you look at marriage types, there can be a direct effect of type of marriage on labor market outcomes, but there could also be this indirect or mediation effect through mental health. Marriage types May um, you know, may affect one's mental health, and that in turn affects labor market outcomes. 
So looking at this um, with a multi-valued multi -valued treatment effect, the total causal effect um, is just the outcome with, um, with um, both the treatment, little t, versus no treatment, and a mediation effect, which is also changed um, at t. The average causal mediation effect is equal to the difference in expected values between outcomes um, with um, treatment, um, mediation with treatment, and mediation without treatment. So put it in, in simple, simple regression, linear regression form. If we have an outcome, a labor market outcome, um, Y is a function of, of a bunch of variables, including a treatment term, beta one, the beta ones will give you the treatment effects of treatment T. The um, beta two will give you the, um, the time, beta two gives you the impact of the treatment on the mediation. And then with mediation entered into a modified um, outcome equation, um, we have gamma times beta two is the mediation effect of treatment T. So, we're going to look at mental at mental health. This is the um, the questionnaire as um, that that appears in English, and there are nine different potential mental health issues um, with um, degrees of severity. We define depression as being and someone answering at least one, you know, has several days, at least at least one yes to questions one through three and six to nine. We eventually omitted four and five because it could actually be coral, it could actually be caused not only by mental health issues, but by physical health problems. And we decided that was that was just adding, there's too much uncertainty in the interpretation. The Degrees of severity generally increase with the numbers. Um, by the time you get to nine, it's a question about suicidal um, instincts. There's not very many people who are suicidal, but as we see, um, we will see momentarily, um, there's a substantial proportion of the population that reports some um, significant depression. The labor market outcome that we've um that we look at is simply what is your how how do you define your status are you an employer an own account worker a wage employee a contributing family member or other and others not very important the especially given what um you know what um Aksana Ismail Bekova said earlier then you know the importance of women participating in the labor force is substantial in Kyrgyz society. And <clears throat> if you're a wage employee, own account worker, or employer, your status, your earnings are likely to be higher than if you're a quote, continuing family worker, which means you're working at home in what we would generally not consider to be the larger labor force, even if you're working very hard. So, if we look at descriptive statistics and look at who are contributing family workers, and this is for the Kyrg ethnic Kyrgyz population only because there's substantial differences across ethnicity. It, the likelihood of being a contributing family worker as opposed to um, as a, as opposed to in other areas, the, it, it varies substantially with the nature of um, with the nature of marriage. And we define four types. There are the so-called, um, what I would call um, in Russian, or which is, can be loosely translated as love marriage, although there doesn't have to be, you don't have to be in love, it's love, marriage by agreement. And then there are arranged marriages where someone, you know, where an external force, parents, a matchmaker, um, um, essentially have large, if not total, say in the marriage. Then there are two types of bride kidnapping, consensual and non-consensual. Overall, about 15% of the Kyrgyz sample reports being 
contributing family workers. Um, these are for women only, I should mention. And um, also above, if you notice that the proportion of population with the report some depression is enormous, like basically slightly more than half the sample. Um, but since it's a very loose definition, perhaps that's not surprising. The proportion who report having severe depression is still very high, at least by North American standards. The um, my next door neighbor, Duncan Thomas, was been part of a study at Duke University on COVID and and depression. Depression, and he tells me that about five percent of um, of adult Americans report being you know, significantly depressed, and that's about one third that of the entire sample here in the life in Kyrgyzstan population. Um, and if you look and see, it's by far the highest for those who came to be married via either consensual or non-consensual kidnapping. So depression significant. And there's a there's very substantial variation in as well in who is a contributing family worker. Um, so step one, marriage types and mental health. We find we have two types of regressions. We have ordinary to least squares regressions. The one that we focus on um, are the instrumental variables regressions that um, following the same technique that um, Susan and Bahram and I used in our demography paper where we simply look at the where we use our instruments are the um, overall incidence of kidnapping, of, of abduction of a particular type of marriage for an elder generation. That's going to make our sample smaller, but it's important to, um, it, it's, you know, it's the best thing we can think of that would make, make it possibly exogenous, sort of a cultural acceptance of, um, of kidnapping or arranged marriages in a particular area. Well, what we find is that um, <clears throat> is that there is um, the like risk of having depression is um, significantly related um, for both um, men and women to um, non-consensual bride kidnapping, um, indeed, and both depression and and severe depression. So it's and the, the effects when you use an IV are actually much larger. Um, and we have a bunch of other you know, standard controls. So strong link between, between the ala kachu, um, pride kidnapping form of marriage, whether it's agreed or, especially if it's non-consensual and de depression outcomes. So we established the T to M link. Now we have to go M to Y. And once again, we find that the likelihood of being, um, in this case, the likelihood of being in a, basically a family worker is much greater um, with, with um, in the case of both having severe depression and being in an arranged marriage but not being in a kidnapping marriage, either consensual or non-consensual, with love or agreed upon marriages being the um, omitted variable. So we find that there's, not surprisingly, education has the expected negative effect. Um, we put in a quadratic age term and um, initially rises, then falls with age, not significantly. Um, rural people in rural areas are much more likely to be um, family workers because there are fewer job opportunities. So Charlie, no surprise. Five, five yes. more minutes. Okay, good. I'm actually on time. So then, so we find that there is a link from T to M and from M to Y. Then we look what's the full, you know, the full effect, the direct effect. Um, and we now look at 
once again, we find here that if we simply estimate the direct, the total effect, there is a strong link between um, uh, both arranged marriage and non-consensual bride kidnapping. Consensual bride kidnapping is not significant. Once again, education, other terms um, are pretty, pretty similar to before. Um, so we see this, we see this total effect in terms of significance, we know that it comes um, largely, much of it comes indirectly. And so we then pull them together and there they are as a, as a total of, of um, total likelihood that attributing the likelihood of being a family worker as opposed to in the formal labor force about a third of the effect comes through having the impact on mental health outcomes being um, depressed or severely, severely depressed. So that's the, that's pretty much the story here. Then we, we estimate this sort of bottom line, um, um, you know, just go to kitchen sink with all a, a, a set of equations with all um, different um, employment options. Um, so once again, being a non being non consensual bride kidnapping vastly reduces the likelihood of being an employer and significantly increases the likelihood of being a contributing family member. Um, that's that's pretty much it. Um, so we we now having pulled all this together, what we show is that. We, we had hypothesized at the outset that there's something about the nature of one's marriage that affects one's psyche, mental health, and it's, we expect that it's going to have larger and larger effects on a variety of outcomes. We've, we've all, Susan and I have already shown that <clears throat> that marriage, that that um, non-consensual bride kidnapping marriages are less assortative. Now we've shown that it's more that they're more linked to poorer mental health. Poorer mental health, in turn, leads to poorer labor market outcomes. It's important, as in conclusion, it's important to show this because there's substantial disagreement on exactly what the nature of of alakachu bride abduction is but we continue to find significant effects this is the first time i believe it's been extended to the labor force so with that i will end and take questions yes exactly thanks charlie for also uh, keeping the time um, and um, as before, please uh, raise your hand or speak up. And I give the first question to Tillman, who already uh, wrote it in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. See, Gary, uh, Chris, sorry. Um, you know, if you write in the chat, you don't even have to raise your hand anymore. Yeah. So I use that channel to come <laughs> in first. Um, thank you uh, for a fascinating uh, talk. And I, it's a really important topic. And I really buy um, your conclusion that. Um, the bride capture has an impact on on both mental health and on on jobs. I'm I just don't understand generically which way it goes. Um, I also do some mental health research and and there with with food security and you know the two way causality is really difficult, right? So what if you have a bad job? Uh, because um, I mean we know that marriage uh, leads to mental health issues, right? <laughs> um, but do we know that? I mean, we also know that jobs can lead to mental health issues. And so that um, sort of reverse causality, I think we should allow perhaps conceptually. And um, one more thought, um, the choice of sector, you know, is that in part explained by who does bright uh, kidnapping? So, you know, if it's a more rural phenomenon, then maybe working in the family business is a more rural phenomenon. And do you see what I mean? Like maybe it's not the kidnapping itself that makes you work at home. Maybe it's the fact who kidnaps that they have the sort of businesses where family labor is needed. You know, if, if teachers went out tried kidnapping, then it would be hard for the wives to work on their job, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So I just wondered if, if that had to do with it. So I 
Um, I, I'm sure you're onto something. I'm just not yet kinematically fully convinced that it might not also run the other way. Thank you. Thank you, Tillman. Let's see if there are other questions. Okay, then maybe, uh, oh yes, Aksana, please. Thank you for your great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I, I have question related to the mental health definition and because uh, I have been writing one project on mental health in Central Asia and it was quite tough as an anthropologist also really find the way how people themselves define mental health because some and this was complicated for example and and it's really different from western conception of mental health compared to for example Central Asian and and I wanted to ask where how do you define where did you get this definition uh, and um, one thing, for example, what was interesting while in my project is in, in Eman Kyrgyz, I can say definitely part of mental health is also shame aspect is so important, uh, living with shame and how this affects to the mental health. Because when you are ashamed of something, then you are you cannot really uh, open up what you are feeling because it's really shame. But it's, at the same time, people keep living with the shame while having these mental health issues. And here uh, I uh, found quite complicated to see the line of the mental health. It's quite emotional. Okay, aspect. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Aksana. Um, Charlie, maybe you can respond in two minutes. Oh my gosh, that's gonna be hard. I could spend like each of those require hours. Um, we have, to, turning first to Tillman, we have a, we both, we have both, I, I, I agree that I'm still nervous about causality. And I, I think the, the, the biggest problem that we haven't really addressed yet is we have the, the quality of match of, of husbands and wives, um, which we've addressed elsewhere. But even if one's, you know, we have information on, we haven't added, we haven't added the big five, um, you know, sort of um, personality characteristic terms. We also haven't linked these outcomes to other to spouses' um, characteristics and perhaps depression. So there's still, yeah, there's still there's still a lot to do there. We do, um, you know, we we do try to make um, a, um, bride kidnapping itself exogenous by using IVs. So, but yeah, I'm still, I am still worried about reverse causality. Um, and we still have things to do about that. We include as many control. I think, I think we do a fairly good job with the controls or we rather we will, once we add, we do a bunch more tests with um, personalities and spouses characteristics. So that's, it's not finished yet. It's not finished yet, but I think to be more convincing, we need to add this. Um, Okay, yes. can you very quickly turn to Oksana's yes. comment? Uh, oh my gosh, that was a super comment by Oksana, and I'm, I'm just, God, there's so much to talk about there. there. We don't, it's, we have, we have LIK survey data on what constitutes depression. They're very standard. Um, if we, adding thoughts about shame would be a wonderful idea for the future. Um, boy, I wish we had it. Okay. Thanks very much for your suggestions. Yeah, okay. Thanks uh, very much uh, to the four presenters uh, and to everybody who asked questions. I think this was a very interesting and very lively and hopefully also for the presenters fruitful um, session. Um, it's getting late in Kyrgyzstan or in Central Asia overall. So I think uh, we should uh, release you now. Um, I know that you've had a, a long day already. Um, so. Yeah, thanks again. I'm very much looking forward to the next uh, days uh, of the conference. I don't know if Damir or Tilman, you wanted to say something at this point, or otherwise, um, let's just give goodbyes. Come all next year to Bishkek and discuss in person, then you have more time to answer the questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, for great moderation of the session. Yes, that's true. We look you, forward. And you were, very un you were very fair on your co-author, which is uh, very nice of you. Um, 
Okay. Great. Then um, again, thank you very much and see you in the next days in one of the other sessions. Okay. Bye bye. Have a nice evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you are. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you all.